You're listening to a CNA podcast. Artificial intelligence. It's kind of the buzz term at the moment, isn't it? It feels like all the time now we're hearing about the latest ways computers are changing the world. They're making images, videos, writing articles. Hey, it's enough to make a journalist fear for their career. When it comes to climate change and the environment in this region, though, AI is playing a pretty interesting role. Today, we're coming eye to eye with our robot counterparts. I'm Jack Board. Welcome to Climate Conversations. Hello to Li Ling Tan. How are you? Hello there, Jack. I am well, apart from a little bit of concern about a future powered by artificial intelligence. Okay, all right. I'm sensing <laughs> the vibes early. In a previous episode, we definitely uncovered your sci fi fandom. So are you a fan or do you really fear a future where AI is more powerful and prevalent than today and any kind of like films or shows that spark that interest or fear? For me, when I was a kid, I'll admit that I loved and I think I was also a little bit scared of Short Circuit. It was a 1986 classic, a robot coming to life. No way. You scared of that cute little robot from Short Circuit? Johnny oh, Five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that show, actually. I remember that was my first like major sci-fi movie. I think for me, though, it's more sci-fi feardom than fandom. The film that comes to mind for me is I, Robot. You've seen that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. There's that scene where we find out that a robot had saved Will Smith's character over a 12-year-old girl because it deduced that he had a higher chance of survival. Now, that bothered me. And yes, it's just a movie. But imagine, Jack, if AI could make that call today based on available data sets about who lives and who dies. Imagine if we had AI during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember when doctors had to make decisions about which patient to prioritize? Should they save a father of three or a teenager, a granddad or a young mother? Should that call be determined by AI based on data about who had a higher chance of survival? Or what if it's not a pandemic, but a disaster like an earthquake, a severe storm or a climate disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Would you bring an injured child or a parent to a hospital knowing their fate would depend on who else is at the hospital at the time? Would you trust doctors to do their best to save your life? So yeah, sorry about the doom and gloom, but... Yeah, wow, you've gone really deep there, these mm. kind of ethical dilemmas when the robots are in charge. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, you know, I just wanted Johnny Five to be free. <laughs> but as we go deeper on AI, these more existential questions will arise for sure. All right, let's get into our weekly quiz. You didn't get it last week, so I'm just going to let you get back into quiz mode of the simpler question this week. Mm. So AI is hot right now. It's been in development for ages, for a long time. Can mm -hmm. you tell me when the first successful program was written, what type of game it learned to play against a human? Tic-tac-toe. <laughs> Whack-a-mole. <laughs> Twister. All right. Answers are coming up in just a few minutes at the end of the podcast. Okay, it's news time. Let's run through some interesting recent sustainability stories from the newsroom. Li Ling, that's you. We got an update from the United Nations on the state of global wildlife trafficking. The good news is that trafficking declined for elephants, pangolins and rhinoceroses. Elephants are prized for their ivory, as we know, pangolins for their scales and sometimes their meat, and rhinos for their horns. Now, seizures, according to this report, peaked in 2019 before dipping in 2020. Although it acknowledges that it's difficult to determine if this was due to policy, law enforcement, suppressing markets for these items, or if it was due to COVID-19 restrictions. The findings do show a slight uptick again after the year 2020, so the battle is not yet won. Already we're seeing South Africa reporting a sharp spike in rhino poaching. And the UN warns that 4,000 wildlife species still fall prey to trafficking, and that is threatening species populations, and it poses risks to ecosystems, food production, and also our ability to fight climate change. So 
Jack, time to stop snacking on those pangolin scales, huh? When will we learn? See what we just unleashed on the planet just a few years ago and stop this. It's <sighs> saddening to hear that this type of activity continues. Yeah, it is. Next up, dirty water bottles. If you're the climate conscious, reuse and reduce type of person, this is for you. Experts are warning that reusable bottles might be dirtier than we think. Apparently, infrequent and insufficient cleaning can breed bacteria and mold. A consumer study in the United States suggests that these types of reusable water bottles can gather more bacteria than a kitchen sink, computer mouse, or even a toilet seat. Ugh, gross. I know. So gross. I know. Ew. So Mediacorp program Talking Point put this to the test by lab testing reusable water bottles. And the results show that bottles rinsed daily and soaked about once a week in soapy water showed a bacterial mold score way above the recommended limit. Now, the bottle that was dismantled and scrubbed with soap every other day also showed bacteria and mold growth, but significantly below the limit. So water quality expert Kwok Chen Ko says in the program that it's because when we eat and then drink from these bottles, food particles get transferred to the bottle and then get stuck in there. Mm. And some of these pathogens can give you a tummy upset or much worse. So the advice, Jack, is to wash the water bottles daily and dismantle them for a thorough scrub. And I hope you're doing that with yours. Ah, guilty. Guilty of Uh, of not being so regular with cleaning my water bottles. But it's only for the gym and for sports activities. I don't eat and drink at the same time from the bottle. But that's enough to make me give it a bit of a, a more regular scrub for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's go to our main story this week. Imagine you have a really smart robot friend. This friend can learn things just like you do. It can see, hear, and understand things, kind of like magic. And when it learns, it can help with all sorts of stuff. Imagine our smart robot friend wants to help the Earth feel better. It can use its brain to figure out ways to stop things like pollution and make the air cleaner. Basically, AI helps by being super clever and figuring out ways to protect our planet, just like how you might try to help a friend feel better when they're sick. Now, this little introduction was actually written by ChatGPT. I asked it to explain AI and climate change as if I was five years old. It's kind of a interesting, nice explanation, I thought. Leiling, you disagree? Yeah, it was. You know, and when I heard you compare it to magic, I something <laughs> went off in my head like, hmm, this doesn't sound like something Jack would say. But otherwise, apart from that, it is very good. I do wonder how objective it is, though. Definitely the AI promoting itself. (laughs) Yeah, it's artificial (laughs) intelligence describing how amazing AI is and upselling itself to a child by saying it's like magic. That kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies, which is why I think AI can only be as good as the person or organization employing it or behind its application. So what about someone using AI to help with environmental issues in Southeast Asia? That was a recent assignment I had to seek out interesting applications. And most of these are problems that are kind of familiar, but maybe we haven't imagined how to solve them more easily or had the means to do so. So let's start with something that we think about every single day. We talk about it. We look at it on our phones. We stare at it through the window. It's the weather. And what I learned is how outdated the weather forecasting we get on a daily basis is. Right. While a lot of improvements have been made over time, the tools are fundamentally similar, essentially using mathematics and current and historical weather conditions and patterns to predict the future. And it relies on expensive satellites controlled by just a few countries. In this region, historically, it's been Japan. And this means small or less wealthy nations typically get far less detailed and far less accurate, precise weather forecasts. So I'm reading from The Guardian that the best five-day weather forecasts are now about 90% accurate, but 10-day forecasts are more like 50%. Anything beyond that becomes speculative. But AI has the potential to shake things up, right, Jack? Yeah, well, that's the promise. And experts are saying that AI heralds a new era in meteorology because of its ability to sift through What are immense data sets? Think decades of complicated weather patterns to work out what comes next. And this is the normal job of a meteorologist. 
And now machines are really complementing what they do. So enter a company called Atmo. They're a US-based company and they've signed an agreement with the Philippines government and National Meteorological Agency Pegasa to provide AI-powered weather forecasts for the entire country. And basically, Atmo started from a baseline of what if you could give the Philippines better forecasts than America? And that means they're aiming to be way cheaper and faster, more accurate, and crucially, I think, much more detailed. And machine learning means the model keeps learning from itself. This is part of an interview I did with its CEO, Alex Levy. He's talking about why this technology can be useful and what it would mean for regular people. Predicting the weather better is one of the best things that we can do to make the challenges of climate change less painful than they otherwise would be. Bad events are bound to happen, but those bad events are compounded when they are surprises, when they come as a shock to the people that experience them. If you know that some adverse set of events are going to happen, and you know that with much greater detail and much greater accuracy, and you can really depend on that to a greater degree than you could in the past, that empowers you to take actions to protect yourself and to do succeed and thrive in climate change. So the previous gold standard forecast would have treated this whole city as like four zones. We treat it as 10,000 zones. So city like Manila or provinces, really any area in the Philippines is going to suddenly see that their forecast is going to go up in detail by 10x to 100x. It's going to be like putting on glasses. And that's really, really important because you know, when it comes to things like inundation and rain and flooding, there are actually really significant differences. You'll yeah. have one part of a city flood and another won't, or even down to a city block level. So people start to get information at that granularity. That is going to be the first thing people notice because it's so visual that they'll just see the detail. So for now, the Philippines project is the only one of its kind in Asia, but other countries in the region are already in various stages of using AI for their own weather forecasting. Singapore and Thailand are examples of those. And seeing that detail was really cool. And I imagined if we as citizens could see that in our regular weather forecasts, it would be really useful as well. Yeah, it sounds like this could be game-changing and life-changing. Accurate weather forecasts means more accurate warning systems for extreme weather, for storms and heat waves and droughts. It can save lives and livelihoods. It can also help countries that depend on farming to better plan when and how they plant and harvest. Let's go to our second example of AI technology. It's also in the Philippines, and they're looking at tackling the plastic crisis along our coastlines. Over there, with its vast marine areas, it's a huge problem. A group of scientists are working on a project called Plastic Count to create a baseline on where plastic is located around the country, what type it is, and how much there is. And they're using drones and AI to literally try and count every piece of plastic waste in the Philippines. Pretty ambitious. So here's Dr. Dio Onda, the project leader. He's telling me how much more difficult that challenge would be if they didn't have this emerging tech. Most of the approaches to do baselining work is very manual. It's very conventional. You go out into the field, you lay one transect, you count the plastics, you write all of it down, and then go to another site again. But you know, the Philippines has the fifth longest coastline. And particularly, that job would be very taxing. That would be very intense. So the idea now is, can technologies actually help us ramp up our capacity to do research. And that's where our entry point for AI, that's our entry point for using machine learning coupled with drone technology as well as higher resolution imaging systems to actually help us do both microplastics and macroplastics. So what's really cool about what the Plastic Count team is doing is localizing problems and solutions. So an example might be, all right, this fishing community on an island far from Manila, do they need to have a plastic straw ban? Are there actually plastic straws out there causing issues? And using this AI machine's ability to classify plastic in the environment in almost real time, 16 different types of plastic, in fact, they can determine, actually, oh, wait, the problem we have here is about plastic fishing lines. So let's develop a pollution policy focused on that instead. 
And the same can be done on a community scale in Manila as well. So this community has food packaging waste. What can we do to actually solve that problem there? So hopefully this kind of information can help us better understand regionally where plastic is coming from, how to stop it getting into our waterways, and when it is there, really localize the solutions. Speaking of waterways, AI can also help to address a concern from one of our younger listeners about coral bleaching. Hello, my name is Leona. I'm eight years old. If the corals died, where would the fishes hide from the sharks? And where would their homes be? Now, they wouldn't be able to hide very well. Clownfish, like Nemo, wouldn't have the sea anemones to call home. Fish will have to venture further into open areas to find food, and that makes them easier targets for predators like sharks. But guess what? AI is actually being used to better track, measure, and monitor from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia to reef fish populations in the Philippines. And that's to gather data that can help save and restore coral reefs. Got to keep looking out for Nemo. (laughs) See, Lili, look, AI has its uses. All right, I concede. But I know there are some concerns as well in its use, its reliability, its energy intensiveness, its power. What scares you the most? You know, they all kind of scare me. Reliability. Earlier, I said AI is only as good as the person who employs it, but it is only as reliable as the data sets it draws from. The lack of credible and precise data, for example, is stymieing AI-based weather forecasting efforts in India, according to a Dialogue Earth report, and that's just one example. Now, it can also be used to mislead, misinform, and misrepresent, including about climate change and its effects, and climate experts have warned us about this as well. Now, on energy intensiveness, it's raising questions about whether it's helping or hindering climate change because of the amount of power it needs. Scientific American points out that AI uses so much computing power and electricity that its carbon emissions is becoming an issue. And that's not even counting the emissions from the applications that AI is being built for. But the truth is that we cannot avoid AI. The proverbial ship has sailed. And so I think we have to approach with caution. Okay, quiz time. (laughs) (laughs) Repeating the question, can you tell me when the first successful AI program that is was written, what type of game it learnt to play against a human. It's not Twister, don't guess Twister, please. (laughs) Not tic-tac-toe or whack-a-mole, I guess. So I don't know when this is, but since we're talking about scientists and computing geeks and very intelligent people, I'm going to guess some kind of game that's like chess. Chess, you're locked in chess. And it's very close. The answer (gasps) was 1951, so... Really, AI has been going for decades now. The game was Checkers. Are you a Checkers fan? (gasps) No. No, me neither. So the game was developed in the UK at that time, and by 1952, the program could play a complete game at a reasonable speed. And games of chess soon followed, and we kind of jump ahead 45 years. We had that really famous Deep Blue versus Garry Kasparov chess match that really thrust AI into the spotlight at that time. Wow. All right, that's it for Climate Conversations this week. Thanks to you guys for joining us and thanks to you, Li Ling, as well. Thank you, Jack, and everyone listening in. You can subscribe or give us a star rating on the platform you're using. It would be lovely if you do. Until then, I'm Li Ling Tan. And I'm Jack Board. More Climate Conversations next week.